go to the kids' church, bro. You got to stay in here with the big boys. <laughs> Can somebody run over and turn on the lights so I can see? Please, 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 please. I won't run, but I'll walk. Okay, that'll work. <laughs> that'll work, that'll work. Praise the Lord. Ah, such a sweet spirit in this house today, amen? amen. God is awesome. <laughs> God is awesome. And it doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter anything. It doesn't matter. It, 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 he's just good. He's awesome. He's awesome in this place. Because he's awesome in this place. Amen. That's what it's all about. Well, we're going to finish our series this morning about It's Not Fair. Okay? We're going to finish our series this morning. And... uh just to give you a real quick recap about what we've been talking about for the last five weeks, because I believe this is week six, and this is the last of the, of the weeks. <clears throat> but in week one, we talked about Adam and Eve's one sin, right? That one sin that they committed that got them banished from the Garden of Eden. And we thought to ourselves, man, that wasn't fair. But at the same time, we needed to realize that we're looking at the one sin that they committed and God's looking at sin in general because God hates sin, right? Amen. Then in week two, we talked about one of the greatest examples ever of it's not fair in the story of Job where Job lost everything and he didn't do anything to deserve it. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't like. He didn't walk away from God. He didn't even say anything nasty to nobody. He didn't do anything wrong whatsoever. But then all this tragedy came upon him, and we thought to ourselves, "Well, it's not fair." But does not God have the right to do what He wants to those that He has created? For He is the Potter, and we are the clay, Amen. and He has the right to mold us and remold us. Any way he desires. Amen. And then in week three, we talked about the young prophet who was lied to by an older prophet, yet God punished the younger prophet even though he was deceived. You know, many of us have been in that same place where we've been deceived and we've done things out of that deception, but God doesn't, he doesn't look at that because this young prophet, even though he was deceived, he still received the punishment, and that punishment was death. And it wasn't just a it wasn't just the fact that he dropped over dead right there. He got mauled by a lion out on the road. So it was a very tragic death. And we talked about how that didn't seem very fair, but the young prophet was given instructions from God. He, he received those instructions directly from God, not from somebody else, you know, not like Eve where she got her instructions from Adam. But these instructions were given to this young prophet directly from God. So if the instructions were going to be changed, God should have been the one who made the change, right? Amen. And the young prophet should have inquired of the Lord to see if the old prophet was telling him the truth. Was he really a prophet of God? And did he really hear from the Lord? God, did, did he really hear from you? Because the last thing you said to me was this. Right? He should have done that. And we learned that if God tells us something, we need to obey it. Regardless of what anyone else says. And when someone says that they have a word from God, we need to take that word and we need to go back to God and we need to go back to God's word to make sure that what we're being told is accurate. Amen. Right? Amen. Does it line up with what God has already said? Does it line up with what God's word tells us about what we should and should not do? And then in week four, we looked at Moses not being allowed to enter into the promised land because he disobeyed God and he struck a rock that he should have been speaking to because that's the, that's the direction that he had got from God. He said, go speak to that rock and water will pour out. But he didn't do that. He went back to what he had known. He went back to his past experience. He said, I don't know about speaking to the rock and whether that water is going to come out, but I know that if I, if I smack it with, this, with my staff, I know water will come out because it already has once. 
we discussed how Moses had done this out of anger and out of doubt because he was angry and, 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 at, at the nation of Israel. So he went into the whole situation with anger already built up inside. And he had doubted God as to whether God, whether or not God would really do this because it didn't make sense to him. He knew that if he, if he smote the rock, the water would come pouring out. But talking to the rock, what would I say? How would I approach this? What in the world would I say that would make this rock pour out water? But I can, I can think that if I hit it with that rock, you know, at least if I hit it with something, it might crack open and pour out water, right? But Moses, he just operated out of that anger. He operated out of that doubt. And he was provoked. He was provoked by the, the Israelites because all they did was complain and grumble. But how many people realize that we should not allow the actions of others to dictate what our actions are? Amen? Amen? Just because somebody may do something doesn't mean that we should act the same way. Just because somebody does something to us doesn't mean we should react the wrong way. How other people act does not give us an excuse to act ungodly ourselves. Amen. And then last week we talked about Uzzah and how in all of Uzzah's great intentions and all of his desire to honor the things of God, he still acted outside of God's will and instruction. Because he was told that we needed to carry the Ark of the Covenant, but they did it. They put it on a, on a cart and they pushed it like the false, you know, like the other nation that were pagans, like the pagan nation did. They put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart and they pushed it. So he saw what they did and he did it that way, knowing what he should have been doing instead. But he did it that way and he dishonored God. And he acted outside of God's will, outside of God's instruction, and Uzzah knew better. He had received the instruction of the Lord directly because he was a Levite. And even though the king gave instructions, there was a greater king who had already spoken. Right? We talked about how David was king at the time, but God is the king above all kings. So when God speaks, we need to obey. We cannot use those who are in authority over us as an excuse to disobey God. You see, King David's the one that gave Uzzah the, the direction to go get the ark and bring it back the way that he did. But just because someone who is in a position of authority tells us to do something does not mean we have to follow it if it goes outside of what God's will and God's instructions have already been. That if an authority requires us or tries to convince us that we must do what we know is wrong, we must obey God before we obey man. And then this week, we're going to be talking about a story that I'm going to call, It's Unfair. No, sir, it's not. Because this is a true story. This is a contemporary story. And it's one that every single one of us in this room can relate to in some way. Because I believe that God has something for each of us that's in this place today. You know, the Bible talks about the fact that we, meaning we, each of us in this room that have given our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, that have been born again, each of us in this room, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right? And Matthew 27, verse 51 says, At that moment, at what moment? At the moment that Jesus breathed his last breath is the moment that it's talking about here. At the moment that Jesus breathed his last breath, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two. And it was torn from top to bottom. You know, and as we talked about a few months ago when we had this, when we were talking about this, this curtain or this veil that was torn, this tearing of the sanctuary curtain, we talked about how it signified that the barrier between God and man had now been removed. And now all... How many is all? all? It doesn't leave anybody out, right? So it, it talks about how all who trust in Jesus for salvation are allowed to enter into the most holy place that we talked about last week when we were talking about Uzzah, right? And as followers of Jesus Christ, we have the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit inside of us, right? That's a gift from God. It's a gift that he promised. And it's amazing that this, this, that this last message falls on the day of Pentecost. 
right? Because the day of Pentecost is all about that gift, all about the gift of the Holy Spirit that was given where he told the disciples and all of his followers to go into the upper room and stay there and pray and wait until I send my gift, right? And the gift he was talking about was the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the power of God inside of us. We talked about that, right? And, and this, is, this is what he gave us as his gift. Therefore, we are now, we are now that most holy place. Because of that gift that he gave on the day of Pentecost, we have all become that most holy place because that's where the Spirit of God lives. And he now lives inside of me. He now lives inside of us. And with this knowledge, we've got to now ask ourselves this question. How should we respond to this reality? How should I respond to the fact that I am the temple of the Holy Spirit? Well, look, let's look at our main text this morning, which comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 through 20. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 15 through 20. It says, Do you not realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Now, I'm going to stop right there for a second because we need to understand what that really means. Because we can look at this and we can, we can get all spiritual about it. We can get all literal about it. We can look in either direction. But what we really need to look at is what is, what is Paul trying to tell us here as he's speaking to the church in Corinth? And he says, do you not realize that your bodies, your bodies, each and every one of our bodies, are actually parts of Christ? Because what he's really saying to us is that we are the body of Christ, okay? Jesus is the head, because it talks about that in another place. And if he's the head, that makes us the body. And then he goes on and he says, and he asks this question. He says, should a man take his body, which is part of Christ... And join it to a prostitute. Never, he says. Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scripture says, the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one sin does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. You realize when you commit sexual immorality, you're committing a sin against yourself? It says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, it says. For God bought you with a high price. And because He bought you with a high price, it goes on and it says, So you must honor God with your body. Why? Because your body now belongs to God. Because He purchased it with the body of His one and only Son on the cross of Calvary. But I want to share something with you this morning. Because this scripture doesn't just have a physical Aspect. It's got a spiritual aspect as well. And I'm going to deal with both of these this morning, but I'm going, to, I'm going to deal with the physical aspect first. Now what we, as the body of Christ, we need to understand is that the act of sex is a personal connection. It is a very personal connection between two people. It is the joining together of those two people. Where they were two individuals before, through that act of sex, they become one. They become united into one. Okay? And what has happened in our society today is this. We have cheapened sex to be just a simple act that is done for pleasure, and therefore it has become no big deal. It's no big deal. I'm just having a little bit of fun. It's no big deal. We're just, we're just doing it because, you know, we got, we got benefits here, you know. We're just enjoying ourselves. We're, just, we're not hurting anybody else. It's just me and her or her and him. 
But these things like one night stands, these things like prostitution and what we now call friends with benefits help to remove the intimacy that God intended a sexual relationship to have. And when a Christian, a quote-unquote Christian, commits sexual immorality, it's a serious offense. And this is why. The reason why it's such a serious offense for you and I to commit this, this sexual immorality is because we have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of us. If you've never realized it before, the reason why it's such a big deal is because of the fact that God now dwells inside of us if we've been born again. And whatever we do to our bodies, we do to what dwells inside of our bodies. Amen. So every act that we commit of sexual immorality, we are joining God to that action. Hello. Hello. Now, with knowing this, we have to ask ourselves this question. Would Jesus hook up with a prostitute? Would Jesus have sex with a man? Would Jesus look at pornography? Would Jesus satisfy himself sexually? Would Jesus live with his girlfriend? Absolutely not. Jesus wouldn't do any of those things. Was he tempted to sin sexually? Absolutely. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, Scripture tells us in Hebrews 4.15, it says, This high priest of ours, and who's our high priest? Jesus. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. And that word testing there, the definition of the word testing there, means to inflict evils upon one in order to prove his character and the steadfastness of his faith. So we can actually read that scripture right there and say that his, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same afflictions of evils upon himself as we do in order to prove his character and the steadfastness of his faith, yet he did not sin. And who's our example that we're supposed to follow? Jesus. Jesus. You see, Jesus was tempted and Jesus was tested in every single way that you and I are, yet he did not sin. Jesus resisted all temptation because of his devotion to God. Now, when we give in to temptation, that means that our devotion to God is not where it should be. Woo! We ought to get excited about that because we're all devoted in this room, right? We're all devoted in this room, right? And if we're devoted in this room, we ain't going to give in to temptation because it's our devotion to God that will keep us where we need to be and not giving into the things that we should not. And here's what we need to come to accept and understand. This same Spirit that empowered Jesus Christ to resist these things and not sin empowers us. Because He lives in us. Hello? We need to resist temptation and we need to resist sin because we were saved in order to be holy, like He was. We were saved so that we can represent God to the rest of this world. In other words, we were called to be different than they are. 2 Corinthians 6, 14-16. It says, do not team up with those who are unbelievers. Do you hear that? Do not team up with those who are unbelievers. For how can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? And how can light have anything to do with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? And how can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And as God said, I will live in them, and I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And here's the facts right here. We can't talk. We can talk with non-Christians. 
You know, we can sit down and we can have a conversation with them. We can talk about who they are. We can talk to them about all different kinds of stuff. And we can share the gospel with them. We can sit, take the time to sit down and share what we know about God and who God is and what God has done for us. We can do these things. But what we cannot do is we cannot become connected to them. We are not to be partners with them, nor can we be in agreement with their practices. Amen. Are you hearing me? Amen. And it's not because we're better than they are. It is because we have been called to be separate from them. Amen. We're called to be different. Second Corinthians six seventeen says, Therefore come out from among unbelievers. Come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them says the Lord. You see, every single one of us, we have to live in this world. So we're going to be around unbelievers. We can't do anything about that. We've got to work with them. We've got to be around them when we go to the store. We've got to be around them wherever we go out into this society. We've got to be around unbelievers. But we don't have to be as they are. We can be separate from them. We can live our lives in total opposition to the way that they live. Not because we're trying to be rude, but because we're trying to set an example as to who we are and who God is in us. Amen. To show them that the way that we're living is possible for them as well. And it goes on and it says, Separate yourselves from them, says the Lord, and don't touch their filthy things. And then, I will welcome you. That's what it says. And though that word filthy things means unclean things. That's what, it, that's what unfilthy filthy means. It means unclean. Okay? It means that which must be abstained from because it causes impurity. So what are we supposed to abstain ourselves from? Anything that causes us to become impure in God's eyes. Yes. Folks, as believers, as Christians... As children of God, we are to separate ourselves from anything. Can, you, can I hear you say that word? Anything that dishonors God the Father. 2 Corinthians 7 1 says this. It says, Because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse, or another way, or, or in other words, separate ourselves from everything that can defile ourselves. Or in other words, contaminate our body or our spirit. Physically or spiritually. You notice it doesn't just say body. It says body and spirit. So it's covering the physical and the spiritual. And it says, and let us work toward complete holiness. Why? Because we fear God. Okay, what we need to get in the church today is we need to get a fear of the Lord. Because it will be the fear of the Lord that will cause us to strive for holiness. Because the lack of the fear of the Lord says, oh, it's okay, God will understand. Oh, I'm not hurting anybody. Or it's just this one time. Or what does God expect from me? I'm just human. I'm just a poor old sinner saved by grace. No, there's just excuses to continue to live in the sin that you're living in. Okay, but since we have this promise, this promise of fellowship with God, and that word fellowship is actually the Greek word koinonia. And you know what that word koinonia means? It means to have an intimate relationship that can only be had by Christians who are in Christ. That definition I find, I find very interesting. Because it says an intimate relationship that can only be had by Christians who are in Christ. So you know what that infers? That there are Christians who are not in Christ. And you know how I know that? Because I meet them every single day. I meet people every single day that call themselves Christians, but the lives that they live do not line up with the definition that I'm giving to you. They do not line up with the fact that they have a relationship with the ever-living God. And it says, since we have the promise of this fellowship, this intimate relationship that only Christians who are in Christ Jesus can have, since we have the promised Holy Spirit living inside of us, let us decontaminate ourselves from all unholiness. 
You know in the New Living Translation, which is the, the translation that I read from most of the time, except for one verse in Jude 23, the only references to the actual word contaminate are found in Leviticus chapter 13 and Leviticus chapter 14. And I'm not going to go back there and read them. You go ahead and read them yourself and see what it has to say. But in these two, in these two chapters, these, the word contaminate here is referencing and talking about dealing with the remedy for dealing with mildew. Okay? And you know what the remedy was with dealing with mildew in the Old Testament? And if any of you have ever dealt with mildew, you, you should know what that is. It was to remove it. Okay? It was to remove it. Because you can try to clean it, but it will just come back. You, you can use whatever cleaner you want. You can use, you know, you can use Clorox bleach. You can use all different kinds of things. And you can just try to scrub that thing up and clean it up all you want to. But eventually it's going to come back over and over again until you remove it. Okay? And not only will it come back over and over again, when it comes back, guess what it's going to do? It's going to spread. Yep. It's going to spread. It's going to get worse. Guess what? The same is true with those things that contaminate us. Hello? Yeah. If we don't get rid of the things that contaminate us physically and spiritually, they will only spread. They will only spread. They will spread... And the spreading will be caused by the contamination in other areas of our lives. It will, it will spread from one area to another area to another area where we might, we might have a problem at work because we deal with the people at work the wrong way. But if we keep doing that and we don't remove that, guess what's going to happen? We're going to start treating other people in our lives and other areas of our lives the same way. Because you're going to bring that attitude home. And you're going to deal with your family that way. You're going to take that attitude and bring it into the church. You're going to deal with your family in Christ that way. You're going to take it out into the world. And guess what? You're going to deal with them the exact same way. Why? Because it contaminates everything that it touches. Okay? But not just does it contaminate other areas of our lives, but it also contaminates other parts of our own body. Sometimes we try to deal with this contamination by just cleaning it up, like I said, where we scrub it and we try to get it up, and it looks clean. Okay, don't get me wrong. When you take Clorox bleach to it, it's going to bleach it all out. It's going to look clean. So what we do is, is we cover it up or we deal with it on a surface level, but we don't actually remove it. Because even though it looks clean, doesn't mean that it is. We don't stop drinking we don't stop drugging. We don't stop smoking. What do we do? We just cut back a little bit. We don't stop having premarital sex. We settle for just one partner and we think it's okay because, well, I love them. We don't stop swearing altogether. We just drop the, the F-bombs and we think that we're doing good. The reality is we don't stop sinning. We just substitute that sin for a cleaner version of it. I'll give you an example. And I can say this because I'm saying it with the right heart. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not using it for the wrong reason. But instead of using the F-bomb, we say the word freaking. That's the new Christian version of the F-bomb. Freaking this and freaking that. Right? But guess what? What is sin? It's a heart issue. Sin is a heart issue. Because it's not about the specific sin as we found out with Adam and Eve. Right? It's about sin in general. And what is sin? It's a heart issue. God is concerned about our heart issues. Amen. And guess what? Guess what? We stop, we stop saying the F-bomb, but we say freaking, but the same heart is behind what we're saying. Amen. So we think we're okay. We think it's all good. But we still have a heart issue, so it's not. We've cleaned it up and we made it look good, but we haven't removed it. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul was specifically talking about sexual immorality. But he finishes the chapter by saying that we need to honor God with our bodies. 
And he continues this whole thought process into 2 Corinthians chapter 7 by saying we need to purify ourselves from everything that defiles or contaminates our body and our spirit. So he takes it from a physical thing to not just being a physical thing, and he says it's just it's not just physical, it's also spiritual. He continues it right over. And in order to do this properly, we need to take into consideration every single part of our body and how that factors into the contamination process. Okay? And this is what I mean. Our eyes are part of our body, right? Okay? So what do we need to do? We need to consider what we're looking at. Right? Our ears are part of our body. So what do we need to consider? What we're listening to. Our mouth's part of the body. So we need to consider what we're saying. Our hands are part of the body. So we need to consider what we're doing with them. Our feet, we need to consider where they're taking us. Our minds, we need to consider what we're thinking about. Our heart, we need to consider what we're feeling. Our stomach, we need to consider what we're feeding ourselves. And our bodies as a whole, we need to consider what we're doing to them and with them. Amen? Because honoring God with our body is really honoring God with all that we are. It's not leaving anything out, not leaving any part out. And Paul says we are to do this out of reverence for God. You know what? That's something that's lacking today. But not just out there. It's also lacking inside the church. We think that because we don't experience the severe ramifications like what happened to Uzzah or the young prophet getting mauled by the lion or even Ananias and Sapphira that was struck dead because they lied that we can somehow get away with disregarding or dishonoring God. But that's a big mistake. That is a big mistake because even David was struck with fear when he saw what happened to Uzzah. Does it even register register with us, even in the slightest, for us to see what God did because His holiness was not respected or honored? Does it register with us at all? Even in the slightest little bit, do, do we even get the slightest little cringe in our gut when we read about these things and about how His holiness was come against and how His holiness was dishonored and then He reacted in the way where He struck people dead on the spot. He had them mauled by a lion. He had them kicked out of the presence of, of, of Himself and kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And it doesn't even register to us even the slightest little bit. We don't get the slightest little uh, in our stomach that says, Whoa, wait a minute, what in the world am I doing? Folks, we really need to reconsider the scripture that we talked about last week out of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 29. And I'm going to read it again because this is something that should always be on our minds. Because it says, Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning, and let me tell you something, after we've been born again, every sin that we commit is deliberate. Yeah. Because every sin that we commit is a choice. Yeah. Okay? And if we deliberately continue to sin after we have received knowledge of the truth, and there's only one thing that in this world is truth, and that's Jesus. Jesus is the Word. The Word is Jesus. So we're talking about the living Word, and we're talking about the written Word. So when we have come, in, come to a knowledge of this truth, but we continue to deliberately sin, there no longer is any sacrifice that will cover these sins. <coughs> For there is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume His enemies. Now listen to this. It says, for anyone. Who's that? Anyone. Anyone. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now praise God that God doesn't do that anymore. Because we have dead bodies laying all over the place. Okay? But he doesn't act that way anymore. He doesn't strike people dead physically anymore. But what he does do is there's a spiritual death that occurs. Okay? 
And that spiritual death is worse than a physical death. Because, and how do I know that? Because of what verse 29 says. Listen to this. Because it's talking about the Old Testament. It's talking about the law of Moses. But we know that Jesus came to fulfill the law, right? We were, we were never under the law of Moses to begin with. And when Jesus came to fulfill the law, He came to, to perfect it, right? He came to complete it, right? And it says, just think, if those people, when they broke the law of Moses, were struck dead on the spot, just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God. <coughs> And have treated the blood of the covenant, which was which has made us holy, as if it were common and unholy. And have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. If that doesn't instill the fear of God in you, nothing will. Amen. Amen. You see, we saw what God did when his law was broken. But yet somehow we still think that because we are under grace, that we will not suffer for disrespecting the sacrifice of Jesus by continuing to live in our sin and not removing it. God is loving without a shadow of a doubt. And God is patient without a shadow of a doubt. He is forgiving and He is merciful. But that does not mean that he will tolerate his people disrespecting his holiness. 1 Corinthians 3, 16-17 says, Do you not realize that all of you together, all of you together, okay? Now, this is a time when I can truly stand behind this pulpit, <coughs> unlike with those that are in government, and say, we are truly in this together, folks. Okay? When they say it, it's just a lie out of the pit of hell. And the reason why I say that is because they can sit up on their on their glorious thrones and they can look down upon us and say, hey, we're in this together. Yeah, okay. While they're being taken care of and everything's working out for them, but we're struggling through to get by and make, make ends meet, right? But we truly are in this together because... We need to realize that all of us together are the temple of God. And that the Spirit of God lives in us. And it goes on in verse 17. It says, God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. For God's temple is holy. And you are that temple. Individually and as a whole. Okay? The scripture says all of you together are the temple of God. And I know that, that that's true. I know that that's real because in 1 Peter 2, 5, it confirms what this is saying. And this is what it says in 1 Peter 2, 5. It says, and you are living stones. Okay? You and I are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. Okay? We are a spiritual temple that houses the Holy Spirit. And this is so important because this is why Matthew tells us in Matthew 18, 8 through 9, it says, so if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Do you hear me? For it is better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both your hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fires of fire of hell. You know what that tells me? That tells me that the whole is greater than the one. Right? The whole body, the whole body is greater than one part of the body. It is better to cut out that which has contaminated the body than it is to let it spread into other parts of the body. Listen to this out of 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 7. It says, Your boasting about this is terrible. Do you not realize that this sin is like a little yeast gotcha. that spreads through the whole batch of dough? How do you solve that problem? Verse 7 says, Get rid of the old yeast by removing the wicked person from among you. 
Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. What we don't realize, folks, is that when we sin, it does not just affect us. If we are Christians, if we've made a commitment to follow the Lord, and we've been born again through that commitment, when we sin, that sin contaminates the rest of the body. That's the that's just the facts. A little yeast leavens the whole love. A little sin contaminates the whole body. So when we think to ourselves, oh well what I'm doing isn't hurting anybody. It's only affecting me. That's another lie out of the pit of hell. Your sin affects all of us. My <coughs> sin affects all of you. Do you hear me? So let us learn from the examples that we've read about over the last six weeks. And let us develop a holy reverence for God. Let us, let, let us develop a holy reverence for His Word and for His Spirit. Because the Spirit dwells inside of us. Now remember I told you at the very beginning of this message that there was a physical aspect and a spiritual aspect? Okay? We may think to ourselves, I've never committed sexual sin. I've never committed fornication, which is, if you don't know it, sex outside of marriage. You may think to yourself, well, I've never committed adultery because I've never had sex with anyone but my spouse. I've never looked at pornography and I've never satisfied, satisfied myself sexually. But don't forget about the spiritual aspect because there is one. These are all the physical aspects. Okay? These are all the physical aspects of being guilty of sexual immorality. But there is a spiritual aspect. Okay? And the spiritual aspect is how many of us fall guilty of joining ourselves to a prostitute that we talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 even though we never committed a physical act Okay? Because the word prostitute in 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 20, means another, or strange, or foreigner, or harlot. Okay? And if we join ourselves to another, it means that we have joined ourselves to someone other than who we were supposed to be joined to. To be joined to something strange is to join ourselves to something other than what is normal. And folks, Scripture has made it perfectly clear that Jesus is the bridegroom and we are His bride. So as the bride of Christ, we become guilty of joining ourselves to a prostitute when we join ourselves to anything but Jesus or anything but what Jesus stands for. This is why Scripture tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 16, Do not love this world, nor the things that this world offers. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything that we see, and pride in our achievements and our possessions. These are not from the Father, but they are from this world world. And then James 4, 4 through 5 goes on and tells us this. It starts right off and says, you adulterers, do you not realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy Amen. of God. What do you think the scriptures mean when they say that the Spirit of God has placed within us that, that the Spirit of God that was placed within us is full of envy. What do you think that means? That means that He wants you and only you and He doesn't want you to be playing around with anything else that's not of Him. He's envious of you and you alone. He wants you and He wants all of you. He doesn't want part of you going out and playing around in the world and doing anything that the world does. The reason for a believer, a Christian, or a child of God to stay away from the world 
and the things of the world is because it is the strange woman, the immoral woman, the harlot we are not to join ourselves with. The world is that harlot. The world is that prostitute. And any time that we dabble in the things of this world, any time that we join ourselves to someone or something that is of this world, we are joining ourselves with a prostitute. And if we have been born again, we are not joining ourselves with a prostitute. We are, we are joining the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Christ to that prostitute. That should make us weep. That should make us mourn. 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 Because for us to join ourselves is one thing. But to join the Spirit of God to what we're doing, Lord have mercy. Folks, we have an obligation to honor God with our lives. We must understand that there will be consequences if we do not. Amen. Is that unfair? No, sir, it's not. No, sir, it's not. No, ma'am, it's not. Because God's holiness demands it. Our commitment to Him demands it. And guess what? His holiness deserves it. Amen? Well, if I've asked people to make commitments before, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to make a commitment today. Because many times when I ask people to make commitments, they make commitments because they think that's what I want them to do. Some, they come in here and they think, well, the pastor's trying to get me to come to church because he wants something from me. No, I don't want something from him. I don't want anything you have. I just want you. And that's where God is. God doesn't want what you have. God wants you. Because he didn't die for what you have. He died for you. So if you're going to make a commitment today, it's going to be because you want to make the commitment, not because I've talked you into it. It's going to be because God convicted you today because you haven't been living like you've made a commitment to it. Look, I don't, I don't know who in here needed to hear this, this message today, but I know that somebody needed to hear it, or many somebodies, because God gave me the message to give to you. I'm not with you when you're not here. I see the way that you act here, and, you know, by, by all intents and purposes, I look at y'all and I think, man, they're all born again, they're all going to heaven. But I don't know what you're doing when you're not here. Amen. I don't know how you're living at home. I don't know how you're living in the workplace. I don't know how you're living in the marketplace. I don't know the things that you're dabbling in behind closed doors. I don't know the thoughts that you're having. I don't know those things. But God does. Amen. And if nothing else, folks, the only thing that I, I hope that this message that God gave me does for each and every one of us in this room today is I hope that it helps us to develop a greater fear of the Lord. Amen. Because only the fear of the Lord will keep us from stepping into the things that we should not step into. Amen. Because let me be honest with you. I don't believe there is a person in this room today that would say that they do not love God. I think every single person in this room right here today loves God as much as they understand what that's supposed to look like. And we really don't understand love until we get into that relationship with God because He is love. And the more, the more we're in that relationship, the more intimate that relationship becomes, the more we learn about love. 
the beginning, when we first make that relationship, when we make the decision that we want to enter into that relationship, it's all about emotion. Right? It's all because somebody said something or we read something or we heard something that, that really just stirred inside of us and it prompted us to give our lives to the Lord. It's all about emotion. Sometimes it's out of a fear, but not out of a fear of God. It's out of a fear of going to hell. It's out of fear of having to deal with the consequences Amen. of the things that we've done. But let me tell you something today. When we respond to God, we can't respond out of our sinfulness. It can't be a response to the fact that we've committed a sin and we don't want to go to hell. It's got to be a response based upon the fear of the Lord. Love will never get us into heaven alone. It must be a combination of love that draws us to God, but it's the fear of the Lord that's going to keep us in God. So we need to have a combination of the two. We need to have love for God, and we need to have a fear of God. Because the one will bring us to Him, the other one will keep us in Him. And the one thing that the church lacks the most is the latter. The fear of God. And that lack of fear may not chase you out the doors. It may not, it may not make you stop coming. But what it does do is that when you're not around everybody that holds you accountable, it allows you to put yourself in a place where you can compromise. Where you can dabble just a little bit in the darkness and it's not going to hurt nobody. Nobody's going to know. It's not a big deal. But the first step that we take towards darkness is the step we take away from the light. Do you hear me? A step towards the darkness is a step away from the light. That's the, that's the beginning of the backsliding, but it doesn't stop there. The first step makes the second step that much easier. Until we come into that place where Scripture talks about that there will be a great apostasia. Okay, the great falling away. But that word apostasia doesn't mean that you're going to walk out the doors. Doesn't mean that the churches are going to grow smaller. Because in a lot of cases, they're not. They're growing bigger. But you know what that word apostasia does mean? It means that there will be a great deviation of the truth. It will mean that there will be a deviation of this truth that will get up here in our minds and the falling away happens right between the ears. Because what it does, it takes all those things that people tell us with their great intentions to try to make us feel better about the sin that we're living in. It makes us feel comfortable in that. When this says we should never feel comfortable in it's a deviation all the good intentions that, that tries to make you feel better that's all the great intentions God is not worried about making you feel better he's worried about seeing your soul enter into the kingdom of God and if that means making you upset right now then so be it even Paul said when he wrote his letters to the, to the churches in Corinth, he talks about how he kept writing these letters and he said, I'm not sorry that I angered you. You know why he wasn't sorry? He went on to explain, he goes, I'm not sorry it, I angered you with what I wrote because what I wrote made you draw back to God. Amen. It made you come back to a place of repentance. So folks, when I say what I say up here, I don't care if it makes you angry, if it draws you back to God. Because I love you enough that I want you to know the truth. I love you enough that I want you to be in the kingdom with me. 
So if you're concerned about enjoying yourself now, if you're concerned about pleasing yourself now, if you're concerned about having all the fun that you can have right now, you're in the wrong place. 